Good afternoon Metalheads, thanks for checking into the Friday 13th YouTube channel. Hope you're all well, I'm doing good. So today you're going to be watching a visual interview which was conducted by former Black Sabbath singer, Tony Martin, a fantastic singer, a great guy to speak to. Tony, thanks for uh, doing the interview, much appreciate it. You rock brother. So we're going to be talking about the new album, Thorns, which is released on Battle God Records. If you've got it, you'll know great, this album is such a fantastic album. If you haven't got it, Go and grab a copy, it's on Battle God Records. The album's called Thorns. So, we're going to be talking not only about, about the Thorns album, we're also going to be talking about the history of Tony Martin, how he became a singer, his time with the involvement with Black Sabbath. He did some fantastic albums. Now, I don't know which one's your favourite, guys, but for me, it's TYR. Absolutely fantastic album for me. Solid album, not one bad song on the album. So, enjoy the interview. Be safe. Stay in metal. Please share this interview on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, also social media sites and groups in Facebook. So, once again, thanks for watching and listening. Enjoy this interview. Tony, you're a legend. You're a funny guy. Keep on rocking, brother. Be safe to everybody out there. Thanks for watching. Stay metal. So, you, so guitar was your first love and then vocals came after? Yeah, I mean, I, as a child and growing up through my teens, I was into electronics. So, um, I, I made all sorts of electronic, musical electronics electronic things as well and went to college and did all that so it wasn't just guitar synthesizers and all sorts of stuff i was interested in and and that really you know exploded from there really right then because i remember when we met in hull years ago not, not a lot of people know this but you actually co-wrote past the duchy by musical youth didn't you uh, uh, mm, i was involved right okay i, 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 I didn't exactly co-wrote it co-wrote it but um i was with uh, musical youth uh, for a uh, two or three years, um, and they—I I, was—I <laughs> was the guy that taught Kelvin how to well the songs because the the skinny was that their dad wrote everything, and then he had a band, us, and then when the kids came home from school, we had to teach the kids what their dad had written in the daytime. They didn't want to know. They were like, oh, man, what's this white honky teaching me? What I know how to play. And they're going like throwing stuff at us. And you can't tell me what to do. Oh, yes, I can. Come here. And he's <laughs> grabbing like, like this. This is, the, this is what your dad wants. I don't care. And it was just like, <laughs> it was a nightmare working with it. It was fun, but it was a nightmare. But um, I got on with them really well, uh, especially Dennis, the singer. Uh, uh, Junior, the drummer, was cool. He was quiet. But then the bass player died. Oh, wow. Just, uh, like, you know, great kids. They're not kids now. But, uh, yeah, musical youth. That was that was a laugh. I bet it was. So, I mean, growing up as a singer then, which vocalist inspired you? Oh, God. Uh, um, well, I suppose, uh, in the rock field, anyway, I mean, Glenn Hughes was like a monster. Yeah. <laughs> I can't sing like Glenn Hughes. Nobody can sing like Glenn Hughes. Only Glenn Hughes can sing like Glenn Hughes. So um, that was seemed way out of my reach, really. But um, I had to find somehow of doing it, and I, I kept pushing and pushing and pushing until it, so it kind of found its own feet, really. Um, and I couldn't really model it on anybody. I did, you know, you, you sort of have these visions in your head what it might sound like, but at the end of the day, your voice is unique. Yes. And there ain't nothing you can do much to change it. You can, you can do some imitations, uh, but it, basically it, it, it's unique. Um, so then you have to really just find out the best way of using it and, and work with the range you've got. I mean, on this new album, Thorns Now, um, I'm five notes down from where I was with Sabbath. Um, this is my new range now on Thorns, so I've had to learn how to use this range. <laughs> So it works, you know, it's good. But uh, yeah, I am down, I'm from with the Sabbath days, but nobody can really sing like they did when they were 20 years old or whatever. And, and they shouldn't try. It just fucks it up. I mean, if you, if you try to do, well, try to do anything like you did when you were 20 years old, you're not gonna be really successful, are you? No, I mean, I saw the daisies in uh, Nottingham in December and Glenn Hughes has still got the voice. Really, yeah. Oh God, yeah, he can still scream it out, man. Yeah, 
I mean, I've, I've I've seen Glenn Hughes live and I watched him at sound check, and he hasn't even had a microphone when he's sound checking. You could still yeah. hear him. <laughs> yeah, he's one of the monsters of the world of the vocals world. Have you actually uh, thought of doing anything with him, like a, an album together? Yeah, I mean, I know Glenn quite well, and every time we sort of meet up, um, we're oh, it's all very friendly, and you know, we sort of hang out for a bit. But we're we're not close enough to sort of say we're best friends or anything. But um, I don't think I'd, I, I don't think I could match him honestly. I, I I I couldn't get close to him. I don't think. I think it'd be a unique album because you've got a unique voice. We know when Tony Martin's singing. When I when I put a, a, like one of these guest albums on, like Free Will, we know when Tony's voice comes on. You know, so you yeah. and Glenn Hughes have got a distinct voice. Yeah, I think he'd crush me. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I think I'd just walk out sulking or something. Oh God. So what was the first actual recording band you did? Was it Life a Force Field or was it something else? No, I mean, I, I've been like um, faffing about with local bands and stuff, obviously, since I was a kid. Um, I think the first time I was ever on vinyl was with a band called Legend. And there was an album called Skin Talk. I can't even remember. I've got it somewhere. I can't even remember uh, what label that was on, but um, we were on that. I mean, the Alliance, you'll have heard of the Alliance. We had um, a publishing deal. We were close to getting a recording deal, but then the Sabbath thing sort of came in. So, you know, um, that changed that direction. Uh, all sorts of people, artists appearing on various things here in the background, sometimes in the foreground. 76 albums and projects I'm on now, something like that. Congratulations. I, d I don't even know. I can't even remember. Of <laughs> I've counted. I've got a list of them. So. You must have a, a collection in your studio of all these gold albums and stuff on your walls. You must have hundreds of them. No. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I don't seem to get present, presented with them. I know they're out there, but I don't seem to get, you know, hold of them. So um, that's pretty disgraceful, really, considering you're a legend and you've inspired a lot of musicians. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, honestly, I don't know what the the score is. I don't know if, uh, you know, I've expected to. I can go get them, or if they're supposed to send them to me, I don't know what the score is. But I, I never seem to get any. That's a shame. That's such a shame. So your first album was Sabbath was the uh, Ten Ladle back in '87. What was yep. your thoughts in that studio at the time when you first went in? What was your, how was you feeling when you recorded that what, album? What would you think if you were suddenly put in a studio with Black Sabbath and you had to sing that? Shit out, uh, shit in uh, bricks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, fuck it out. I come from sort of nowhere, really. Um, the, from the alliance had broken up. Um, and I'm talking to the guys again now. We're thinking of getting the thing back together and doing some finishing off the job. But um, that it st actually started in 1986. My manager Albert Chapman at the time, he was an old school friend of Tony Iommi and Ozzy Osbourne, and they grew up together. And in fact, Albert was one of their tour managers in the early days. And so. He'd sort of been friends with me, he'd sort of mentioned that I was looking for a gig. Anyway, 1986, Glenn Hughes, uh, Seven Star. Yeah. And uh, they, they called up and said they'd got, they'd got some issues with Glenn and he'd gone missing. And they said, they might, we might have a gig for you. And I'm going, holy fuck. I, and like I was saying to you earlier, I can't sing like Glenn Hughes. So that scared me to death. And they said, learn, start learning some songs. And I went, oh my God. Um, and then a bit later on, they called up. It's all right. We found him. Don't worry about it. We'd step down. So I was quite relieved about that. Then 1987 came, and then they had Ray Gillen. Yeah. Then he left to join Blue Murder, and uh, with Glenn, uh, with uh, John Sykes. And they called me again and said, "Okay, uh, we think we've got a gig for you. You better start learning some stuff." Well, I didn't have any anything of the new album. They just gave me this one song, which was The Shining. And uh, they said, come down to London, try out, and we'll see how it goes. So I went down to London, just sang the one song, really. And um, I said, okay, well, we'll call you. Well, two days later, they called me and said, right, you've got the job. You've got a week to sing the album. <laughs> oh, my God. So honestly, it was a mixture of fear, uh, kind of excitement, but shit in my 
pants and God knows what else, all sorts of things. But I have to say, and I say this a, a lot in, in when people ask me about it, uh, just because it was already written and the melodies were already there, the lyrics were already there, I didn't have to do much, you know? All I had to sort of do, they said, don't change anything, just, you know, sing what's there. They hadn't got time to rewrite the whole thing again. Um, which for me was good because that gave me an opportunity to learn. Uh, and then that kind of set me up for when Headless Cross comes. Now that's me writing melodies and lyrics. So now, okay, now, now I know where I am, what I'm doing ish. Um, uh, then I could sort of kick into it and sort of go my own way. But f uh, honestly, it was a good thing to have that eternal idiot, eternal idol. We call it eternal <laughs> idiot. Uh, the, the Eternal Idol album, because I was able to uh, learn, it, you know, it was a big learning curve, really fast moving, and then we were on the road, and then that was another learning curve, and it was, oh my god, what the fuck's happening? So, yeah. I remember I remember when the Eternal album came out, just before, like you said, you recorded it on, there's some YouTube uh, footage of uh, Ray Gillen doing the vocals. Yes, yes, his, his version is out there, um, and it's good, you know, it's just that he left. <laughs> He went to join, you know, Blue Murder. I mean, the uh, second album you did with them, like Headless Cross, fantastic album. I mean, obviously, you would have felt more control, more relaxed, writing your own songs. No, right. Not as much pressure. I mean, I did my best with Eternal Idol. I, it, it came out okay, I think. It's a brilliant album. I love it. Um, but essentially, I'm just copying what was already there. And yes, you're right. By the time I got to uh, Headless Cross then now I'm starting to feel a bit more comfortable and I'm, uh, I've got used to the guys a bit more. Although the oh, by the headless cross, there'd already been about four band lineup changes. Yeah, I heard about that. Mad, absolutely mad. You, you do not know who you're working with next. Correct but... me if I'm wrong, did you, have, did you have a different lineup for the tour in America than what they did in Europe? Oh, we had a different lineup for each day of the week, mate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! We we had it started off talking to Geezer Butler and Bev Bevan. They both left. We had uh, Terry Chimes on drums. We had <clears throat> Dave Spitz on bass. We, uh, it just changed about five times, you know. Before by the time we got to Headless Cross, and we didn't have a bass player by the time we got to Headless Cross. In fact, I played bass on some of it, and and uh, Devil and Daughter. That's me. Oh wow! <laughs> playing bass on that. Uh, and then they got Neil Murray, sort of halfway through, uh, where were we, at the end of Headless Cross, because we had Laurie Cottle. Lawrence Cottle was another bass player. Oh, so maybe there were six lineup changes then. So you, oh, so you guys on tour trying to do a signing session would have been impossible for, for the fans, because they wouldn't have been. <laughs> oh, just, uh, honestly, it was confusing, it was ever-changing, it was fluid you know it was unbelievable tony iomi's management kept changing and it was mad yeah, I, I think i remember reading that you had it was like you you had a manager tony iomi had two managers and it's like how the hell do you work together when you're all at each it, other's oh, it must have been chaos it got worse um when geezer butler came into the band his wife gloria she was a manager so i had a manager geezer butler had a manager tony iomi had three managers why <laughs> <laughs> Well, they sort of did um, various parts of the management thing, and they were a team, so that they had Ian Gillen, they had uh, Tony Iommi, they had like you know various artists all in the same group of management. But it made it so hard to work. I mean, I just uh, pfft, that I've, I I lost I lost almost lost the will <clears throat> because you. You couldn't talk to one of the guys directly. It sort of, they'd say, oh, speak to my manager. Go, oh, really? Man, you just stood there right in front of me. But no, so to go up to my manager, across to their manager, down to them. Then it would go back up through their manager, over to my manager, back down to me. I mean, come on. It was a little bit like Spinal Tap, you know, when they were all, all those, each one of them had their own manager. It was on their wives and stuff. So basically, it was you saying to like Tony Iommi's manager, "Would you like a cup of tea? How many sugars?" And then it come back three hours later when, when the <laughs> kettle was cold. <laughs> yeah. By the time it gets back to you, it, it's like that old saying, you know, in 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 the First World War, they'd say, "Send a message along the lines," and it'd start off as, um, "Send reinforcements 
we're going to advance. And by the time it come back, it was sent three and four points. We're going to advance. <laughs> <laughs> God. I was like, you know, what the hell? So just briefly going back to the Turn Adler, what songs from that album are your favourites and why? Do you have any favourites from that album? Oh, they're all pretty good. I mean, I I, I had to learn. It, it became part of me. Um, it, I, I like them all, really. I mean, I suppose uh, the track, The Eternal Idol, is my uh, ultimate favourite, I suppose. But no, they're all great, honestly. Yeah, yeah. What, what about the hairs? What about... Say, just, to, just to interrupt you there, yeah. I have to say, the guys are great to work on. I, I know I, I I make jokes or fun of like the, the way they work and the management and the rest of the stuff, but they, they were nice guys. It wasn't like they were being particularly nasty or anything. Yeah, right. And so Headless Cross, what's your favourite songs from that album? Because that is a really good album. Um... Well, that was slightly different because I wrote it, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a bit biased. I, I'm starting to get more biased by the time it comes to Headless Cross, and we got um, some really good riffs in there, but because Cozy Powell's on it, uh, it became a different beast. You know, um, the power was different, and the and the, I, I learned a lot from Cozy Powell. How he engaged with the song was really impressive. He wasn't just a drummer. He would accent to the lyrics even, you know, so that he would make sure that the the song was one whole thing, not just a drummer playing in the background and then us playing over the top of it. Uh, so he was very involved in it and he was part of the production at the time. So it was a bit of a bastard because like when I did uh, Nightwing, we, we had a, a little bit of a, an argument. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, the Nightwing was the first and only take, and I was I, re, I refused. I said, "No, that's not the, that's not it. I can do better than that." He said, "No, no, 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 that's the one. Thank you." I went, "No." He said, "Yes." I went, "No, yes." I said, "Look, I need to do it again." No, you don't. We're using that one. So he said, "Look, I'll give you two more goes. If you if you can better this, we'll use it. If you can't, we're using this one." So right then, yeah, fine, I'll do it again. So do you think I could? No. So he was right. And in the end, we used that. Nightwing was the first take that we did for that song. Wow. So, oh. Right, okay. So he was a bit of a taskmaster, but he knew what he was talking about. And, um, you know, ultimately, what a great bloke. I mean, yeah. Just... Fantastic drummer as well. Yeah, I never got I never got to meet um in, um Cozy Paul. I almost did when he was playing drums for Ingvay Malmsteen because he recorded Face in the Animal album and he was supposed okay. to be in tour in Europe, but he died. So the drummer was using Cozy Powell's kit for the tour, his wooden oh, really? mahog mahogany wood kit that he had. Oh wow! Some Swedish drummer. Yeah, I don't know who the guy was, but he was using because I was interviewing Ingvay Malmsteen that night, and he said to me that's Cozy Powell's kit. Wow! Yeah. How special is that? Yeah, I know. And uh, so the next album, the best um, to me, this is my favorite Black Sabbath album of all time. T Y R, fucking fantastic! Yeah, I fucking love it, man. You know, just really? you know, it's, every song is just solid. It's like the it number one. Incredible. Forget about Ozzy Osbourne Sabbath. This is the ultimate no. album. <laughs> okay, but do you see what's happening with Sabbath at this point? By the time we've got to tour, yeah, is that um, we've got all arty farty, <laughs> and we've got layers of keyboards and layers of guitars and, and, and choirs and stuff like that. So that I kind of started with Jeff Nichols way back in the Dio era, where um, that freed up Tony Iommi to start playing solos over the top of keyboards and layering sounds and stuff like that. And then that kept going. Then up through Headless Cross and now to Tear, we're actually in the studio and I'm doing 50 tracks of vocals like you know to build up a choir or you know whatever well there's no way you're gonna sing that on stage so we were then reliant on samplers to trigger you know the, all those voices and the rest of the stuff that we'd layered um so it got really quite technical in the end and i i do understand why you know some people wouldn't attach necessarily to that era of black sabbath but it is a great album and you know to have that the power of tony iomi and cozy powell on it was just enormous yeah it's, it's such a solid album the production's fantastic the songs it, are solid there's not one bad song on the album i just you know it is great well thank you i mean obviously we i appreciate that um 
we um, would we thought we were doing the right thing at the time. So you know, I only have one regret: not seeing you on that tour. I've never seen you sing with Black Sabbath, and I regret not seeing you with Black Sabbath. Is that ever, yeah, is that ever going to happen for me? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I was there either. <laughs> but yeah, um, <laughs> um, it was a good time, I think, and I was quite comfortable in, in what I was doing. So to be fired after that was a complete surprise. I didn't see that coming at all. What happened there? I then? What happened? Been... I mean, that's a bit bizarre. Why I'd be fired on such a great album? You can see what's happening. I mean. It, they, they obviously, at the time when we were doing The Eternal Idiot, there was, the band was down. Do you want to know the story between this, this Eternal Idiot? Go on, man. Let, let me know, Tony. Go on, man. Go for it. Okay, it's quick. Right. So, at the end of the Eternal Idol tour, we came back home and we went straight to Tony Iommi's house. Well, he had, at the time, he had a gardener there and it was an Irish dude. And we walked uh, across the front yard and, and this guy says, Tony! Yeah, no album. The Eternal Idiot. I fucking love it. Like that. <laughs> and I only turned to me and said, did he just say, call the album The Eternal Idiot? I said, yeah, he did. I said, fuck you, no. So that's why it stuck then. We always called it The Eternal Idiot. Anyway, um, that, we've always called it that since, but that's an injury. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, from tier after that getting fired, I have no idea what the... Uh, process was but you can see what's happening because now from Sabbath being a bit dodgy with endless lineup changes and and people not really working much with them and they're starting to get a bit of a dodgy name we'd actually started to build it up uh, through Eternal Idol through Headless Cross and into Tear now it's all started to feel like it's coming together so you can see them saying Ooh, oh, okay, it's getting good again now, and people are listening, so let's get Ronnie back in. So I can see how that would work. Um, it didn't quite work in uh, when they started doing the Dehumanizer. I was doing my first solo album, Back Where I Belong, um, and they called me and said, can you come back? I went, no, no <laughs> I can't. No, fuck off sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, no, it wasn't. <clears throat> Exactly, but he was like, No, I can't because I was doing my solo album. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, that was Tony Iommi. And then he called me back a few weeks later. He said, You sure you can't come back? I went, No, okay, what's the problem? He says, It's not going well. We're having problems with Ronnie, and he didn't tell me what the problems were, but uh, he said, Well, it's not, it's not going great. Um, I said, Okay, he said, Will you come down and try? He said, Okay, I'll go. And I went down to South Wales, they were in, and um. I went to the studio and ran through some of the songs that they were working on. And I, I did try, uh, I, but I needed to rewrite it to make it work for me. And they, they couldn't rewrite anything. So I said, you know what, the best thing to do is carry on with Ronnie and then maybe we can sort of talk after. And kind of that's what happened. So we were still talking to each other, even through Dehumanizer, really. Right. Um, so I got fired, which was a complete shock. And then... Then they were talking to me again, and then it came back together again for cross purposes. Um, and then they got Geezer in. So, you know, it, it, it feels like it never, uh, there wasn't a complete break. You yeah. know, I'm st they're still talking to me. And I, I think they like my voice. And I was cheap. So, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I, I do see the reasons behind it, even if I'm not part of the process. I know you did like, because you did that solo on Back Where I Belong, which is kind of a hard rock blues album, so going back to your roots, yeah. I guess. Good album. It, did, it didn't really fly. I mean, uh, to be honest, once I got fired from Sabbath, I didn't want anything to do with it. I was just like, rah, fuck that, I'm not doing that again. And so I just wanted to get a, as far away from it as I could. And at the time, I was still into that, like, 80s, 90s, commercial rock type stuff. And I thought I'd give that a go, but um, great musicians and fabulous, you know, to be in in that situation. First time I've ever worked with a gospel choir. That's mad. Standing in a room while they're all kicking off is fantastic. Um, that was amazing. Um, but the the album didn't really appeal and it didn't sort of fly. So um, 
it was time to move on after that. You know, I thought, well, I would get back to doing something else. But then joined Sabbath again. And of course, now it's cross purposes and with Geezer Butler in the band. And, and that was good. You know, I enjoyed that working with Geezer and, and everybody. So after that, whoa, you know what comes after that. Yeah, I mean, I know for a fact that you haven't done one bad album with Sabbath. I think every album is consistently strong, but like I say, TYR is like my favourite of all time. It's the best Sabbath album ever recorded. No disrespect to Air, dear, but hey, you know, I like that one well, more. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, thank you. I mean, it, it is all very appreciated, and everybody's got their own favourite, haven't they? Yeah, of course they have. You know, um, and I, I love hearing why people like. I mean, people even call me that contact me and said that they love Forbidden. I'm going no. And they go, yes, it's great. No. no I'm going to I'm going to ask you about the Forbidden now because when we met in Hull like 20 years ago. Well, I was interviewing you at Hull City Hall. We mentioned the Forbidden album, and you told me you looked at Tony Iommi and thought, "What are we doing this album with the rappers for?" Yeah, it was that. Well, Cozy Power thought that as well. I, I have to say, you don't look a day older. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've aged pretty well for considering I'm 51 now. <laughs> I can't see any of the wrinkles, mate. <laughs> Cheers. Um, <laughs> this colour, I am actually this colour. This is genuine grey. <laughs> so, what, um, I mean, that Forbidden Arm wasn't a bad album when you think about it. I think it was just the production because you've got rappers trying to play metal, produce metal, and it kind of didn't no. work. No, it was deeper than that. It was it was very political. Um, when we started the Forbidden album, I've got video of us in the rehearsal of writing, and it was great. You know, we were all having a laugh and, and getting on, and the songs were sounding, you know, pretty heavy. And then, like, we had this message from the management saying, um, we're going to get Ice T to sing on the album, and, and we all went, what? And then they said, yeah, well, uh, you come from meeting in London and, and Cozy Powell instantly said, well, that ain't going to work. <laughs> so I said, no, I, how does that work? I don't even understand what that's about. Well, when you think about it, they were, you know, obviously they're trying to do the run DMC type thing, you know, they, um, but um, Black Sabbath. Anyway, we went to this meeting and, and we were trying to say, well, ah, I can't see how that worked. They said, it is going to happen. Um, we're, the guys are going to come over go back to the studio and, and work with them and see, see how it comes out. Well, okay. Ice-T, his dude was Ernie C. And um, it, they came to the studio. Okay, if you can imagine Cozy Powell sitting there and he's, he's got his hand on his hip and his drunk sticks in his hand and, and they're saying, right, can you play this? Can, can you play that? And, and Cozy's looking at them with that look that says, you do know who I am, right? You know, Cozy Pal, and he went, yeah, 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 we know, you're great, we love what you do, man, it's like, really cool, uh, but can you try this? And he said, all right, I'll give it a try. Um, so trying to teach Cozy Pal how to play drums is, like, not really great. Okay, he did a good, pretty good job. So then, on top of that, I've got the message that Ice-T is going to sing on the album. So I said, uh, uh, okay, uh, what's he singing? Um, singing one song, two songs, a line in a song, what's he doing? And I said, well, we, we don't really know yet. Uh, keep going and we'll sort of decide later. So we keep going. A bit doubt, further on down the line, I said, okay, you, you, what am I doing? You, you've got to tell me what I'm doing. Is Ice-T singing all of this or some of it or what? And he said, we, well, we still don't really know. Um, keep going and we'll decide down the line. Okay, I get to the studio and I still didn't know if I'm singing what on the album. So I can't concentrate. I couldn't put my best into it. It was just like so detached. And I was just, it was like horrible, really horrible. Um, I didn't know until they'd mixed it what Ice-T was doing. That's the first time I heard what his contribution was going to be. So I really felt shit about that, and I thought, hang on a minute, this this feels like I'm going to get fired again. Do you know what I mean? I was just like in that frame of mind where it was just horrible. And in the end, uh, it, it, they sent me a, a, a fax saying, we, this is their management, that said, uh, we're not sure what format the band's going to be in after this. So what the fuck does that mean? I mean, you know, it was just horrible. So for me, the whole Forbidden album was a mess. It was just uncomfortable. It was horrible to work on. I don't think I, I gave it my best 
yeah, I wasn't really in my mind to be able to do that. Uh, and so that's why Forbidden doesn't resonate with me. But now, you talk to some of the fans and they really hook up to some of those songs, you know. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear that it, you've reached somebody with what you've done. Um, so it isn't a complete failure as far as the listener is concerned, but for me, it was just really, 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 really hard work. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I remember listening to the album for the first time and I felt the same as you did. Real uncomfortable with what the album was just like, mm, yeah, it just didn't seem right. I think you can pick up on it. Other people don't. I mean, they say, oh, we never noticed anything, but I, I think you can. Yeah, it's just personal. I mean, I'm, I was in the band, so, you know, that that's why I, I can sort of say that. But, you know, like I said, there are fans out there that love it and um, it's being remixed now, apparently. Wow. Uh, so, um, for the new so what's happening? What's happening? Because all your all your albums you did with Black Sabbath got deleted, didn't they? And, I, and then apparently there's a box set coming out. Is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't know when. Um, they called me and said, again, Tony Ohm, his manager, called me and said they've got a deal for this collection. Um, that it is going to be a box set, not individual albums. Um, well, okay, <laughs> whatever. But you see, uh, and I don't get a penny from Sabbath because it's not on sale. You only get royalties or you only get money if it's being sold. So if they, um, uh, for example, delete the, or they finish the record deal and they delete the albums from catalog, that's it. There's nothing, there's no money going out anywhere. And, and it, it seems like a, such a frustration to me that 10 years of a career is just missing. It's, you know it's I mean? stupid. So it doesn't make sense. It, it, <clears throat> no, it makes sense if you're trying not to let it cloud. Uh, oh, how do I be diplomatic? Um, so, mm, okay. If I said Ozzy was like trying to focus the band back into the, you know, Sabbath name and th that everybody knows at the beginning, then you would only want people to concentrate on that. So anything else is a distraction. You know, so if you don't want the distraction, you don't release anything else that compete with it. So I, I can see the political bits behind it. Band politics is one of the worst things. But um, essentially you've got 10 years of a history of a band that is not out there. And people are still asking me today, you know, Just... where can I get it? How, what happened, you know, all that stuff. So I know people want to be part of the story you know, and, and I think it's essential that it's there. So, Fortunately, it's going to be re-released, as I understand it. And, um, you know, I don't know when, and I'm not part of that that decision-making. I have no control over that or what it looks like or what it sounds like. So I, I await as much as you do to find out what uh, comes next. I mean, they should put some live DVDs in there from that era. Yeah. The problem that they've got <clears throat> is uh, originally Tony said to me, about four years ago, actually, when Jeff Nichols died, uh, we met at his funeral, of all places, and um, he said, you know, potentially we could get some new tracks and put them on the albums and, you know, make a thing out of it. But then uh, he came back to me uh, well, a couple of years later. <laughs> the phone doesn't ring that often. Um, and said, we can't do it. There's, we can't do anything new under the Black Sabbath name. So uh, we can only do what we had then at that time so then i started looking for songs that weren't released which we've got and i've got but then i don't understand because if we if you re-release songs that weren't released at the time now that's new isn't it so <clears throat> the, the criteria is a bit strange to me i'm not sure exactly how they get around it but we'll have to wait and see mate honestly um i don't know what the outcome of that's going to be no. You probably know more information than I do, to be honest. No, I don't actually, but I'm the same as you. But like, see, you've done absolutely hundreds of like guest appearances and albums. You've done like the Cage albums, the Genie yeah. Project, Dario yes. Molly albums. You know, as like Empire, yeah. tons. How do you keep? How do you keep busy? Um, to be honest, that's where my life took me. That's where my career went. Um, I became a singer-songwriter, and I came into the studio, and I'm still here after 25 years. Um, probably more, uh, but um, 
that's how I earn my living. That's how I um, keep myself active. That's how I keep my um, face and voice out there with the fans so that I haven't disappeared. In this business, I have to say, it's one of the first things that was ever taught to me in the music business. You have to keep your face out there. It doesn't matter what it is. You just keep your face out there because then people fade you know, quickly. And um, even that, like on Facebook, for example, even just changing the avatar photo, it goes public and people, oh, oh Tony Martin, still is right, or something. It could be anything, it could be anything. As long as you keep people talking or interested, then it's easier to pick up along the line when you, you need to reintroduce yourself or whatever. And that's kind of what's happened with Thorns because I've uh, been doing these guest appearances and, and you know, the press mumbling about stuff. Finally, when I've got Thorns together after like 13 years, um, it uh, it was ready to lift and, um, you know, hooking up with Scott was one of the best things to do. So all of those guest appearances that you're talking about and all of those things is what I do to keep me out there. And it's important to do, you know. So have you talked about doing a new Cage album with Dario? You... Yeah, I mean, the, the possibility with all of those things, anybody that I've ever worked with, the possibility is always there. Um, you know, um, I, I, you could you could pick up an, on any of them and, and it's possible to get something going. But how, how do you make it fly? You've got to pick up on the mood of the moment and you've got to be really into it. So we've done three Cage albums, <clears throat> excuse me, and none of them really flew. They didn't fly very high. So um, you've got to then think a fourth one. Okay, it's got to be bloody good if you're, you know, gonna fly over the top of the three ones you've done before. Uh, so the thought is, well, maybe it's possible. Same with Giantini. Giantini is actually a wealthy man who it's his hobby more than anything. Um, but you know, take any of the others. I mean, I, I've just done uh, a guest appearance with Quill. <laughs> Don't know them. With Bev Bevan. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, Quill is an old Birmingham man. Uh, it's very, oh, dare I say hippie. Uh, ah, anyway, ah, yeah, okay, whatever. No, I better stop there. Um, it, it's um, a, a different thing altogether. And then I recently did something with uh, a band called Secret Society. Yeah, I've heard that. That's I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of gothic sort of sounding thing. Uh, it's all possible. I mean, I don't mind working with anyone, <clears throat> providing I can make me sound like Tony Martin. It, Otherwise, there's no point, and my head won't allow me to be a session singer. I, it, it, I just can't do it. Some, believe it or not, some words don't fit with certain notes. Um, it's got to be in my range. It's all boring stuff, but you know it, it has to work for me. Um, otherwise, I can't. Um, I can't get a grip on it, you know, and, it, uh, and that's the only way I can make my voice sound like me. So. It's all possible working with other people all of the time, but it's got to work. I mean, you did, so, you did the um, M3 thing with all the White State members. Is that like kind of like an offshoot what Yawn did? Because Yawn was with a company of snakes. Is that kind of the same sort of thing? It was. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I didn't really handle that very well. It was, um, I wish I'd been able to make something better out of that. <clears throat> but that whole thing is very clicky and very close-knit. Um, what fab players, I mean, Bernie Marsden and Mickey Moody, when they were like in a room together, just the, the things they <laughs> create, the, the ambience that they can make is fabulous. I could sit and listen to all day. But to be part of that whole bluesy, white snakey kind of thing, you've got to be in that zone. And my voice isn't, and so I struggled with it a bit. I think you did a uh, great job, actually. I did okay. I mean, I, I did my best, but um, then there was like some personality clashes, you know, so and it, it, I, uh, I was at the time not in a great place, so it didn't really work for me, but I would love to have made it work better. 
it's just the you know the way things evolved it didn't really turn out but being part of that whole white snake thing oh fabulous songs aren't they yeah i mean bloody hell I mean, after that, you did like, um, you was involved with Candlemas, weren't you? Did you only record demos because you're on that live DVD they put out? It was, it was in, intending to be part of the band. Um, the, the problem was that they hadn't got any time. Um, they had, they sort of sent me this stuff and I sang and they went, yeah, it's great. When can you join? I went, ah, <laughs> um, uh, can I just uh, sort a few things out? No, we have to do it tomorrow. Oh, right. Okay. Well. In which case, I'm, you, you're going to have to run without me. I, I just couldn't get on it. Um, so, yeah, it ended up as just being demos. Right, because I was going to say, on that live DVD that they put out, you came up and did some songs, didn't you, with them? I did come and do a little <clears throat> guest appearance with them, just to help them out a bit. Um, and just to lift that. It was all part of the whole idea of being part of it. But lots of things happen. Yeah, they do. And, you know, not always in the direction you expect. So you did the uh, Secret Society. I mean, Andy the Rocks produced that, King Diamond's guitarist. How did you get involved with those guys? Oh, Facebook. <laughs> they just found me on Facebook and said, will you sing our song? But no. <laughs> he said, go on. No. I'll send me the track and I'll have a listen. So they sent me what they got. And it was, it was good. Um, it wasn't, uh, well, it wasn't how it ended up. I mean, I said I had to work on it a bit to get it to that state. Um, but it, I could hear something in it. And so I sent them back a version of what I would do if it was me, like, singing in it. And they went, yeah, that's fucking brilliant. So um, I said, okay, give me the track, um, all individual instruments and stuff, and I'll do a, a proper sort of vocal on it. And um, it turned out like that. But... I added all of the choir and, you know, the, the gothic, you know, stuff that's in the background. And I worked out all of the, the words in Latin. <laughs> I did like the whole thing and they was just stunned. And so then they put it out as part of a, an album. They had other singers, I think. Yeah, they've got Ronnie Ronro from Metal Church. He's, he's singing on okay. one song. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I didn't hear the whole thing, but um, yeah. I did that one track and it took off. <laughs> it just went mad. It really got a lot of exposure. So uh, I was really pleased with them, you know. I, mean, I, 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 mean, I don't know when the album's released because they've only released two videos, your song and the one with Ronnie Monroe at the moment. <laughs> yeah, again, I, I'm not part of the decision-making process, so I don't know uh, what happens there. But uh, I'm very happy to have been part of that. It's just another one of the guest appearances that, you know, um, I, I have been on. Yeah. Like I said, 76 of the buggers somewhere down the line. You're doing well, you're doing well. So um, let's talk about the new album, Thorns. Oh, right, yes, thank okay. you. After <laughs> we're talking about the Sabbath stuff. Sorry about that, Tony. But, um, yeah. you know, um, why did you go with Battle God Records? I mean, I thought Frontiers might have been one of the big labels that approached you. I've, n I've never had a great thing with Frontiers. So Cage was on Frontiers, a couple of other things. And um, it's all very, uh, to me, Anyway, it's all been very distant and not very family orientated. But um, uh, the way I got involved with Battle God was um, Tony Mills. Okay, you remember Tony yeah, Mills? He, shy. He died. Yeah. yeah, he died. And weirdly, he invited me to his living wake, which is a celebration before they die, which is a strangest thing. Really is. And, and, uh, he had all his friends and people that he'd worked with in the past all came together. Um, and we were all drinking his health. And of course, he's saying, look, this is the last time we're going to see each other. He said, I just want to have a word with you. He said, you have been my inspiration for fucking years. He said, you're an amazing singer. He said, I've, every, everything you've done, I seem to have followed you all around. He said, I just want to ask you something. Um, my record label, he'd done four albums with Battle God already three or four albums with them and he said can you just give them a try I said um, have a chat with them and see what they you know, do he said they work really hard um, you know they're, they're not in like every corner of the world but he said they work really hard I said mate I'll, I'll be happy to give them a, uh, a go I don't mind giving people a try so I had a word with them and they were very enthusiastic um, 
and then um, I sort of wanted to get some presence in America, all the Americas, North and South. Um, and so I, I wanted to have a, another album, on, uh, sorry, another label on board to do the Americas. Um, well, the guitarist Scott McClellan, he sort of introduced me to Dark Star. And so I said, you know, you guys, it, is there any way you guys can work together? You know, do like a joint thing. And they sort of looked at it and said, yeah, we think we can do that. Well, I've done it before. Uh, you know, with Sabbath even, they did IRS and EMI. They did a joint thing, you know, uh, and different territories around the world. So I know it works. So I, I sort of said, okay, but if you guys can get some, strike up some kind of deal. Battle God became the lead label and then Dark Star licensed it from Battle God. So uh, it started, it was working all right. And um, at the moment, it, you know, it's still cool to have those two labels doing their thing. They work in such different ways to each other. Um, and they, they not always, you know, they don't always like each other, <laughs> but the, as long as they don't mess up the album, then I'm happy to let them just do their thing and, you know, get it out there, which has been happening. And I'm, I'm really happy with the way they've been sort of doing mostly of it. <clears throat> so, Battle God, yeah, Tony Mills. That was a long answer, weren't it? Yeah, so what other, label, <laughs> so what other labels approached you besides Battle God then? Who else did you go to? I didn't <clears throat> tell anybody. Nobody approached me. You see, once I'd started this thing with Scott, right, I mean, I started Thorns 13 years ago, and it was going to be called Book of Shadows, like as on the track, Book of Shadows, that's on the album. And I was really interested in the time at that sort of gothic -y, unplugged, full of choirs thing, but with like a heavy riff underneath it. And um, I thought I was going that way. Well, I'd sort of started writing, and I'd done Crying Wolf, and your, This Is Your Damnation, the really weird one. Um, I'd sort of done those already and uh, then I sort of met Scott and he started sending me like all this heavy shit and I'm going what the fuck he's going to send more and more and more kept sending it well, well wait a minute so I had to I had to contact him I said this stuff do you want me to sing on something he went, and he was like yeah man like whatever you think and I was going okay I'll do one and see how it turns out that was As the World Burns the first track on the new album and it turned out great. And I was like, okay, don't tell anybody <laughs> about this. Don't tell your mum. Don't tell your nobody. Don't tell anybody. Don't talk about it at all. I said, we, we need to find out how much we can put together. And um, so he started sending me all these riffs and ideas. Now, the only way, like I told you earlier on, the only way I can do it is if I can make it sound like me. So... The way I said the deal was okay, send me whatever riffs you want, and then I'll cut them up and I'll move it around and I'll make it fit like to how I need it. Verse here, chorus there, all kinds of stuff like that, and then I'll send it back to you. So over time, we started building up this album's worth of stuff, and then by the time it was you know getting towards the end, I had to then think, well, am I going to keep like Book of Shadows and Crying Wolf and stuff like that? And I thought, it sounds good with all of those unplugged things and the heavy stuff all in at the same time. And it was starting to sound like an old kind of album where you have all these different layers of you know, uh, different dynamics on the same album. And I was loving it. And I thought, okay, well, I better try and put these songs in, in some kind of order. Did you notice they're all in alphabetical order? No. <laughs> uh, it's... As the World Burns, Black Widow Angel, Book of Shadows, Crying Wolf. <laughs> it's all in alphabetical order. Well, anyway, I came to putting these things in order, and I was looking at the folder of, of files, and you're going, wait a minute. They are in order. They're already there. So when you sit back and listen to this thing, like you're listening to it on the album, that's how it sort of appeared. I went, wow, that sounds really good. So then I said to Scott, right, you know what? It's time. We, uh, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna see what we can find, you know, record deals and stuff like that. And it was, it was easy. People were interested in it right from the start, which I'm really pleased about. Um, 
so then I started seeking out labels and because I'd sort of promised Tony Mills that I'd give uh, Battle God a try and um, uh, I promised uh, Scott I'd look at Dark Star and then they kind of agreed they'd work together which gave me a whole worldwide coverage thing um, I thought it was good you know um, and, that, and so I ran with it, and it's turned out great. I, I am, I am thrilled. Yeah, because I mean, Scott is in a Pantera tribute band. I mean, I, why did he go to yeah. Scott? Why, why, why not anybody else? <clears throat> he, he's unknown to most people. Um, uh, he was very. Um, he's younger than me, uh, a fair bit younger than me, but um, because he kept uh, uh, sending me stuff, uh, I was interested. This guy is so keen. Um, and he's really humble. I mean, he's like, yeah, um, so easy to work with. And that, that reminded me, um, the way he keeps writing very prolific of, uh, working with Tony Iommi. Um, I was able to cut up the same process with Sabbath. They, they used to play riffs and then I'd take them onto my eight track that I had at the time and I'd cut the riffs up and put them into where I needed them. Same sort of process. And it worked really well with Scott. So I said, look, mate, if you're willing, um, it has to be a Tony Martin album. He said, yeah, 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 that's fine by me. I said, so we'll go out like that and um, I'll put it to a few people. And it, it was really quick. I mean, uh, everybody was picking up on the songs. So um, I, I ran, sort of ran with it, you know, with Scott. I like him. He's a nice dude. He's been to England. He lives in America. He came to see us. He recorded his guitars over in England. Um, Danny, the drummer, Danny Needham, you know. Yeah, Danny. he used to be in Venom, his Venom drummer. Yeah. Still, still does things with him, I think. Um, what a guy, fab, great drummer, good, really cool to have him. Magnus Rosen on bass. Yeah, from Hammer, ex Hammerfall. But you've worked with Magnus before, haven't you? I have, yeah, doing some stuff. They're all friends, you see. Greg Smith also made an appearance on bass. He's been with like Alice Cooper and Rainbow. I played some bass. I play some guitar. My son is on there. My daughter is on there. Oh God! It, oh, and um, Bruno Sarr. There's only one uh, like keyboard solo on the whole album on Book of Shadows, but ah, Bruno's fabulous. I've worked with him before. Um, Dario Mollo did a solo on um, Run Like the Devil. So it's all friends. It's all people that I know. Um, it does create its own. A problem I have to say I mean like I said to you at the beginning my career took me into the studio so I don't have a band um, so if I wanted to go out on the road I have to create the band from the beginning I have to hire the musicians um, and start at the beginnings if they're available then you have to re rehearse it like a lot um, and uh, then you need six months in advance to book the tour so it, it's harder for me to, to go out on the road, but I am looking at, uh, at doing that as soon as we get the opportunity. Yeah, I think I did. I did mention to you if you need a merch seller or a drum tech, I do both. So I'm yeah, up for the job, no, Tony. Fine. I've got you in mind. Thank you very much, sir. But, um, uh, but um, so, so, so um, go on. No, go on. You was going to say. No, I was just going to say it's harder for me to get on the road in the first place to start the whole thing because it's not like with Black Sabbath. It's a massive machine. It's all in place, and everything you know that you ever want is there. Um, if you start from the beginning, you have to create all those things, you know, and it, it, it's just harder. Uh, I was going to say that some sometimes the promoter uh, uh, finds you a band, and then they just get you to go and sing with it. Well, they can be great players sometimes, but it, it can look and sound a bit like a tribute act because it's not quite, it's not, eh, you know what I mean? It's not quite like there. Um, so I, it's always been hard for me the live thing. I, it, it's never been a huge success. I've noticed. But, I've noticed that he did a live concert in. I think it was Brazil with some Brazilians, like Ripper Owens. He has Brazilian for South American yeah. musicians they hire. Okay, well that Brazilian band is where Bruno Sa, the keyboard, came from. Uh, uh, he he was in that band. Um, again, um, great players, but yeah, I couldn't quite get it to knit. Do you know what I mean? And. When you do it, when you try to reproduce things, especially like Sabbath stuff, fans know what it is. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to, you've got to do it the best you can. Well, in those days I had Jeff Nichols, which was a help because he helped me to 
uh, tell the other players how it should be. Now I don't have Jeff Nichols, he's sort of died, so it's even it's harder. But um, it is something I'm looking at and I'm hoping you know, at some point to get out. But COVID kind of um, put a halt to most of any plans that I could get together anyway. So um, we're already started writing the next Thorns album. Um, so hey, I mean, who knows? Maybe we do another album and then tour two albums in together or something. I don't know. Right then. So, but, so the album title is, Thorns is that the only title you had for the album? Well, it started off being Book of Shadows, as yeah. I sort of mentioned earlier. Actually, it got used. Well, well, I kind of got used. To it. it was Book of Shadows. Then somebody else made an album, uh, Book of Souls. I wonder who that could be. Um, then um, it was going to be called Black Widow Angel. It had like these titles. In the end, um, I ended up on Thorns because of the track. And we, you know, Pamela Moore sings on uh, Thorns. And um, it was such a, um, a, a great song. I mean, it just started off as a song, just a song, you know, and it needed a girl singer. Uh, I couldn't do the girl part because essentially the story is a girl, woman, um, who ends up on the streets. She self-harms because she's been abused and uh, she doesn't want to hear, she doesn't listen to anybody. She doesn't want anybody to say anything kind because the words feel like thorns, you know, sticking in her. Um, I couldn't sing the girl part and her, Pamela Moore's name came up. You know Pamela yeah, Moore, right? Yeah, Queensryche, sister, sister. Right. Sister Mary, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, ah, Pamela, yeah, I know Pamela Moore. So I gave her a call and she was into it immediately. She said, yes, yes, that's what I would love to do. And uh, she came back with that. I gave her a few ideas and, and she did a really good job. Then, turns out that Thorns is starting to become a little bit of an ambassador for those who have been abused and have been stuck in that situation. Well, that's not what I intended the song to do. I mean, I, I, that's not why I wrote it. It was just a song. Um, but I've had, well, three or four professionals contact me since uh, saying that they, they just, the song says everything, you know, about that situation that you could be in, how people know about it, but they never really respond to it. And that, you know, COVID made it worse because then they couldn't escape. Um, and so it, it all be, it started to become a bit of an ambassador for that subject. And I don't mind, I, you know, as long as it's not cheesy or, you know, a bit, you know, uh, mm. but um, yeah, it's turned out to be bigger than the song and the album had to be called Thorns. Wow. So, you know, uh, I love the artwork that goes along with it and the, the imagery that we've, um, we've done. Tally Savage and her husband Matt uh, did a fantastic job with the artwork and that mysterious dark but classy sort of look um, uh, was everything that I was feeling about it and uh, chuffed that it, it turned out. The actual print on the album was a bit dark and they're reprinting it again now so, to lighten it up but um, yeah fantastic. Very, the whole thing was come together. It's very dark and gothic. Yeah it is. It's the, you know, it's the way the album and that whole song thing, and I know it's a bit old school in places, but there are some modern elements to it. Nothing wrong with old school, that's the best stuff, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> yes. um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with it, and I just wanted to thank everybody for, you know, being part of the story. Um, I'm going to have to cut this short, I'm right. afraid, my I'm going to ask you some more questions quick before we go, just about the, the, the album titles, like, As the World Burns. I mean, as soon as you hear that song, it just slaps you in the face. It's like, my God, this is heavy. It's like, it's sort of like a painkiller version of Tony Martin. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Uh, you know, like I said, it's all uh, old school stuff, God and the Devil type thing. Um, but with me, it has to have a story yeah. to it. So I, I do endeavour to put stories in it. And, and those God Devil themes... Um, bands have been writing that good and evil stuff for decades it, it still works that whole theme um you just gotta have a good story with it you know so that's what i try to do on the these songs you so know. what's your favorite songs on the album do you have any favorites um uh yeah actually i i, I really like the one that greg smith one was on uh, no shame at all it's a bit rock and roll that one but um and thorns itself 
uh, Book of Shadows, it's like gothic -y and like choir -y. <laughs> So, um, and actually I do like This Is Your Damnation. I know it's a bit weird, but uh, it, it, when there's a video for it, it'll, it'll make more sense. Right, so who produced the album? Was it yourself who produced it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I got a, a guy to work with, um, Pete Newdeck. Uh, is he, it, uh, he used to be Needham's Curse. Yeah, yeah, drummer, but he's started producing stuff and he's really good. Really quick! My God! And because of COVID, we also had a good thing. He set up an internet connection so that I could directly hear the output from his desk. Um, and then we had a video uh, connection, which um, was great. It, it all got fixed up really quickly in the end. So how long did it take to record this album, then, would you say, roughly? 13 years. 13 years. 13 years from the beginning, from Book of Shadows, right up until today, 13 years. Right. It wasn't supposed to take that long, but there you go. Right then, Tony, I'd like to thank you for doing this interview. It's a pleasure speaking to you again. It's been a long time. No, thank you. Um, we need you guys to let people know what we're up to, and uh, so we don't take it lightly. Um, we do appreciate uh, you doing these things. Um, just like to thank the fans as well. Uh, they invite us into their homes and their cars and their headphones, um, and we love that. That's what it's all about for us so um keep rocking and uh thank you again thanks tony can you just do a little promotional video for me just saying please check out friday 13th youtube channel subscribe that sort of thing thank you <laughs> what how's it go just ask friday. if you could just say to somebody some of the people watching please check out friday 13th youtube channel please subscribe it's free if you could do that for me i'd appreciate it so i'll do it on a separate audio yeah. thing if i can okay then tony well, have a nice day send me a text of the uh, a, a, a tag that you want me to sort of say, and I'll I'll get that done for you on a, an audio file. Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Be safe. Have You're a nice day. Very welcome. Thank you. Yes, I will try. Thank later. you, mate. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Tony. Another question. Cheers, <laughs> Bye. mate. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>